Book of Heaven, Volume 11, Part 4. August 14, 1912. In order to forget herself, the soul must do everything, not only because Jesus wants it, but because Jesus himself wants to do it in her. If he redeemed us with his passion, with his hidden life he sanctified and divinized all human actions. As I was in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus told me, My daughter, in order to forget herself, the soul should make it in such a way that everything she does, and that is necessary to her, she does as if I myself wanted to do it in her. If she prays, she should say, It is Jesus who wants to pray. And I pray together with her. If she has to work, it is Jesus who wants to work. It is Jesus who wants to walk. It is Jesus who wants to take food, who wants to sleep, who wants to get up who wants to enjoy himself. And so with all the other things of life, only in this way can the soul forget herself, because she shall do everything, not only because I want it, but because I myself want to do it. It is necessary precisely to me. Now, one day I was working and I thought to myself, how can it be that, while I am working, it is Jesus who works in me, and he himself wants to do this work? And Jesus, I myself and my fingers that are in yours are working. My daughter, when I was on earth, did my hands not lower themselves to work the wood, to hammer the nails, and to help my foster father Joseph? While I was doing that, with those very hands, with those fingers, I created souls and called other souls back to the next life. I divinized all human actions. I sanctified them, giving a divine merit to each one of them. In the movements of my fingers, I called in sequence all the movements of your fingers and those of others. And if I saw that they were doing them for me or because I wanted to do them within them, I continued my life of Nazareth in them. And I felt as though cheered by them for the sacrifices and the humiliations of my hidden life, giving them the merit of my very life Daughter, the hidden life that I conducted in Nazareth is not taken into consideration by men, when in fact, after my passion, I could not have done a greater good for them. By lowering myself to all those acts, little and lowly, those acts that men do in their daily lives, such as eating, sleeping, drinking, working, starting the fire, sweeping, and so forth, all acts that no one can do without. I made a divine little coin of incalculable value flow in their hands. So if my passion redeemed them, my hidden life provided each human action, even the most insignificant one, with divine merit and with infinite value. Do you see, while you work, working because I want to work, my fingers flow within yours, and while I work in you, in this very instant, how many am I bringing to the light of this world with my creative hands? How many others am I calling back? How many others do I sanctify, correct, chastise, and so forth. 
Now you are with me, creating, calling, correcting, and so forth. Therefore, just as you are not alone, neither am I alone in my working. Could I give you a greater honor? But who can say what I comprehended, and the good that we can do to ourselves and to others by doing these things because Jesus wants to do them in us? My mind gets lost, therefore I stop here. August 16th, 1912. Thinking of oneself blinds the mind. Thinking only of Jesus is light for the mind. This morning, my always lovable Jesus told me, my daughter, the thought of yourselves blinds your minds. It forms a sort of human enchantment in them, and this human enchantment forms a net around man. This net is made of weaknesses, of oppressions, of melancholies, of fears, and of everything evil contained in the human nature. And the more one thinks about oneself, even under the aspect of good, the thicker the net becomes, and the blinder the soul. On the other hand, not thinking of oneself, but thinking only of me, and only of loving me, whatever the circumstance, is light for the mind, and forms a sweet divine enchantment. This divine enchantment also forms its net but this net is all made of light, of fortitude, of joy, of trust. In sum, of all the goods that I myself possess. And the less one thinks about oneself, the thicker that net becomes, to the point that one no longer recognizes oneself. How beautiful it is to see the soul wrapped in this net that the divine enchantment has woven. How delightful, gracious, and dear to all heaven. The opposite for the soul who thinks about herself. August 17th, 1912. The thought of oneself makes the soul smaller. While I was praying, blessed Jesus told me, My daughter, the thought of oneself makes the soul smaller, and from her smallness, she measures my greatness, almost wanting to constrain me. On the other hand, the one who does not think of herself, by thinking of me, expands within my immensity and renders me the honor due to me. August 20th, 1912. Jesus is close to the soul, waiting for her to call him to do what she does together with her. Man proposes, God disposes. Continuing, my always lovable Jesus made himself heard for just a little and told me, my daughter, how sorry I feel in seeing the soul huddled within herself, in seeing her operating by herself. I am close to her and look at her, and seeing that many times she is unable to do well what she does, I wait for her to call me and say, I want to do this thing, but I am unable to do it. Come and do it together with me and I shall do everything well. For example, I want to love, come to love together with me. I want to pray, come and pray together with me. I want to make this sacrifice, come and give me your strength, for I feel weak. And so with everything else, 
gladly and with greatest delight I would offer myself for everything. I am like the teacher, who having assigned an essay to his pupil, remains close to his student to see what he does. Unable to do well, the pupil becomes worried, worked up, upset, and he may even cry. But he does not say, Master, teach me how I should do this. What is not the mortification of the teacher in seeing himself treated like a nothing by his student? Such is my condition. Then he added, It is said, man proposes, God disposes. As soon as the soul proposes to do some good, to be holy, Immediately I dispose around her the things that are needed, light, graces, knowledge of me, stripping. And if I do not achieve the purpose with these, then by dint of mortifications, I allow nothing to be lacking to her in order to give her what she has proposed. But oh, how many escape by force from amid this crafting that my love has woven around them. Few are those who persist and allow me to accomplish my work. August 28, 1912. It is love that transforms the soul in God, but it wants to find her emptied of everything. Continuing in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus came for just a little and told me, My daughter, the other virtues, as high and sublime as they may be, always cause the creature to be distinguished from her creator. Only love is what transforms the soul in God and makes her one with him. So, love alone is what triumphs over all human imperfections and consumes what prevents the soul from passing to take divine life in God. However, there cannot be true love if it does not receive life and nourishment from my will. So it is my will that, united with love, forms the true transformation with me. That soul is in continuous contact with my power, sanctity, and all that I am. Therefore she can say that she is another me. Everything is precious. Everything is sanctity for that soul. It can be said that even her breath or the contact with the ground that she treads is precious, is holy because these are nothing other than effects of my will. Then he added, Oh, if all knew my love and my will, they would stop leaning on themselves and even more on others. Human supports would end. Oh, how insignificant, painful, uncomfortable they would find them. All would lean only on my love. And since my love is most pure spirit and does not contain matter, they would feel so much at ease leaning within me and with the effects they want. My daughter, love, wants to find souls emptied of everything. Otherwise it cannot clothe them with the garment of love. It would happen as to someone who wanted to wear a suit. But that suit is stuffed inside, so he is unable to fit in it. He tries to put an arm in the sleeve, but he finds it blocked. So that poor one has to either put it away or make a bad impression. The same with love. When it wants to clothe the soul with itself, if it does not find the soul completely emptied, it withdraws, embittered. August 31st, 1912. Love, 
symbolized by a dazzling sun, defends the loving soul and keeps her safe. As I was praying for a person, blessed Jesus told me, my daughter, it happens with love, symbolized by the sun, just as to those people who can easily do their actions only as long as they keep their eyes low, for the light of the sun descends mildly into their eyes. But if they want to fix their eyes on the sun, especially if it is midday, their sight remains dazzled, and they are forced to lower them. Otherwise, they would lose the attitude of their actions. They would have the worst of it. While they would cause no harm to the sun, that would continue its course with its majesty. So it happens, my daughter, to the one who truly loves me. Love is more than a majestic, imposing sun for her. If people look at her from afar, the light of love descends mildly into their eyes, and therefore they can plot, lay snares, speak ill of her. But as they try to approach her, to fix on her, the light of love shall flash into their eyes, and they shall end up moving away and no longer thinking about it. And the loving soul shall continue her course without even thinking about whether they are looking at her or not, because she knows that love shall defend her in everything and shall keep her safe. September 2nd, 1912 The Harm of Self-Reflections for a Soul Who Loves Jesus The souls who are united with the divine will and think only of loving Jesus are united to him like rays to the sun. I was saying to my always lovable Jesus, my only fear is that you might leave me, withdrawing from me. And Jesus, my daughter, I cannot leave you because you do not reflect on yourself, nor do you have any concern for yourself. For the one who truly loves me, self-reflections, self-concerns, even in good, are many voids that she forms in love. Therefore my life cannot fill the soul completely. I am as though put aside, in a corner, and they give me the occasion to make my little withdrawals. On the other hand, if one is not prone to reflections on her own concerns, but thinks only of loving me, she takes care of me, and I fill her completely. There is not one point in her life in which she does not find mine, and if I wanted to make my little withdrawals, I would have to destroy myself. That can never be. My daughter, if souls knew how harmful self-reflections are, they bend the soul, they lower her, they cause her to keep her face turned inward. And the more they look at themselves, the more human they become. The more they reflect, the more they feel their miseries and become miserable. On the other hand, thinking only of me, of loving me, of being all abandoned in me, makes the soul straight. And by keeping their faces turned to look at me alone, they rise and grow. The more they look at me, the more divine they become. The more they reflect on me, the richer, stronger, and more courageous they feel. And then he added, My daughter, the souls who are united with my will, who allow me to carry out my life within them, and who think only of loving me, 
are united to me like rays to the sun. Who forms the rays? Who gives them life? The sun. If the sun were unable to form its rays, it could not extend its light and its heat. So the rays help the sun to do its course, and they make it more beautiful. The same for me. Through these rays alone, that form one single thing with me, I extend myself over all regions, giving light, grace, and heat. And I feel more embellished than if I had no rays. Now one could ask a sun's ray how many courses it has made, how much light and how much heat it has given. If it had reason, it would answer, I don't want to bother with this. The sun knows, and that's enough. Only, if I had more lands to which to give light and heat, I would do it, because the sun that gives me life can reach everything. But if that ray wanted to reflect, to look back at what it did, it would lose its course and would become dark. Such are the souls, my lovers. They are my living rays. They do not reflect on what they do. All their intent is to remain in the divine sun. And if they wanted to reflect, it would happen to them as to the sun's ray. They would lose much. September 6, 1912 the ones who experience the benefits of having Jesus close to themselves. Continuing in my usual state, blessed Jesus came for just a little and told me, My daughter, I am with souls, inside and outside of them. But who experiences the effects of this? the one who comes close to my will with his will, the one who calls me, who prays, and knows my power and the good I can do to him. Otherwise it happens as to that person who has water in his home, but does not go near it to take it and drink. Even if there is water, he does not enjoy the benefit of it and burns with thirst. In the same way, if he is cold, though the fire is there, he does not go near it to get warm. He shall not enjoy the benefit of its heat, and so with all the rest. What is not my sorrow, as I want to give, but there is no one who takes my benefits. September 29, 1912 the soul most favored by Jesus. Jesus is the one who disposes the intentions of the soul who lives in his will. The use of natural goods in the divine will. I am writing of past things. I was thinking to myself, the Lord spoke to some about his passion to some about his heart, to some about his cross, and many other things. I would like to know who has been favored the most by Jesus. And my lovable Jesus, on coming, told me, My daughter, do you know who has been most favored by me? the soul to whom I have manifested the prodigies and the power of my most holy will. All other things are parts of me, while my will is the center, the life, the ruler of everything. My will directed my passion, gave life to my heart, and exalted the cross. My will encompasses everything, captures everything, and gives effect to everything. Therefore my will is more than anything. 
as a consequence, the one to whom I have spoken about my will, she has been the most favored, among everyone and above everything. How much you should thank me for having admitted you to the secrets of my volition. Even more, the one who is in my will is my passion. She is my heart. She is my cross. And she is my very redemption. There is nothing dissimilar between myself and her. Therefore, in my will do I want the whole of you, if you want to take part in all my goods. Another time I was thinking about what would be the best way to offer our actions, prayers, and so forth, whether as reparations, as adorations, etc. And my always benign Jesus told me, My daughter, the one who is in my will, and does her things because I want it, does not need to dispose her intentions herself. Since she is in my will, as she operates, prays, suffers, I myself dispose these things as I best please. Do I like reparation? I placed them as reparation. Do I like love? I take them as love. Being the owner, I do with them whatever I want. Not so for those who are not in my will. They are the ones who dispose, and I comply with their will. Another day, having read in a book about a female saint who first had almost no need of food, and then needed to feed herself very often, her necessity being such that she reached the point of crying if they would not give her something. I remained concerned, thinking about my state, since once I used to take very little food and I was forced to bring it up, and now I take more and I do not bring it up. And I was saying to myself, Blessed Jesus, what is this? I consider this as my lack of mortification. It is my badness that leads me to these miseries. And Jesus on coming told me, My daughter, do you want to know why? Here I am to make you content. At the beginning, in order to make the soul completely my own, to empty her of all that is sensible, and to place in her all that is celestial and divine. I detach her even from the necessity of food, in such a way that she almost does not need it. So finding herself in this condition, she touches with her own hand that Jesus alone is enough, that nothing is necessary for her any more, and the soul rises high. She despises everything. She cares for nothing else. Her life is celestial. After I have established her well, for years and years, no longer fearing that what is sensible might cause her even a shadow of an impression, because after the soul has tasted the heavenly, it is almost impossible that she might appreciate dregs and dung. I give her back to ordinary life, because I want my children to take part in the things created by me for love of them, according to my will, not to their own. And it is only for love of these children that I am forced to feed the others. Not only this, but to see these celestial children take the necessary things with sacrifice, with detachment, and according to my will, is for me the most beautiful reparation for all those who use the natural things not according to my will. How can you say that there is badness in you for this? Not at all. What's wrong with taking, in my will, a little more or a little less of dregs? Nothing. Nothing. 
In my will there can be nothing evil, but always good, even in the most insignificant things. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 11, Part 4. Fiat.